I would like to thank to Marek for his introduction, but I will correct uh, at the beginning that this talk is not going to be about image classification, but it's just going to go beyond that. It's going to go for, uh, it's going to introduce uh, uh, semantic segmentation, object detection, and uh, and uh, instance segmentation. Uh, yes. Yeah, so briefly about me. I'm Jan Zikesh and uh, I currently work at SpaceNow. I'm basically playing with uh, convolutional neural nets 24-7. And if you would like to, you can follow me on GitHub or Twitter under this handle. Uh, yeah, so first of all, uh, I would like to ask uh, how many of you in here has no machine learning experience at all? Okay, good. You know, I'm just checking. Uh, I know some faces here, so I'm not afraid that I'm in wrong meetups. Uh, but uh, yeah, just to know uh, what is your background. Uh, who of you in here has uh, no deep learning experience at all? Okay, just okay. It's good. And uh, how many of you has, uh, let's say, deep learning experience? Some basics. Uh, how many of you have tried some example for image classification? Or stuff like this. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, like the m main audience for this uh, talk uh, are people who have some basic experience with deep learning. And for those of you, I think it's gonna be uh, informative and good uh, for people that have no experience with deep learning. It might be tough to catch up at some at some points, but uh, I'll hope to. Uh, I hope I'll be able to explain something more f uh, for you as well. So uh, I'll just recap uh, some stuff about uh, convolutional neural networks for classification. Here is some list of uh, famous architectures that uh, starting like five years ago or maybe even, uh, even more uh, started to win competitions for image classification. Uh, I think uh, important to mention is AlexNet, VGG, ResNet, those are the most famous ones. Uh, various versions of Inceptions, uh, DenseNet or ResNet, but those are architectures for, for classification. And uh, those other methods for semantic segmentation and other tasks are leveraging those. So basically uh, having some idea about how those architectures look like is good. Uh, I'll try to briefly recap this on, on VGG16, which is very common and one from the most famous uh, neural nets uh, from 2014, actually presented on conference 2015. And uh, this is, uh, here I will show basic blocks of uh, deep neural nets or convolutional neural nets. And this is basic, basically convolutional layer that's followed by ReLU, and then max pooling layer uh, that's uh, highlighted in red in here. And uh, this is basically, this can be considered as, as a feature extractor, or in some papers they call it backbone network. And it's followed by fully connected layers, and at the end uh, there is usually some kind of classifier. This is the standard setting for image classification. But the goal of today, uh, today's talk is gonna, uh, gonna, uh, gonna be to go beyond that. Uh, okay, uh, those methods are pretty old. Uh, they appeared back in back in 60s, I guess, and then. Uh, but back then, uh, there was just ideas, and there wasn't computational power. And uh, recently, in like 10 years ago or five years ago. Uh, it showed up that uh, GPUs are enable enablers for training uh, bigger, deeper uh, deep nets, and uh, basically, uh, it's it's kind of hack. But uh, people are people are able to hack this uh, backpropagation training or other other kinds of trainings uh, to put them on GPUs. And uh, this is particularly how it looks at Space Now, where I work right now. Uh, this is the way we used to have it. Uh, this in Czech Republic, this would be from beer, but uh, in the US, it's from milk. This box, and we had uh, those plastic straps uh, that were holding those GPUs. 
Uh, those boxes were built by our CEO in his home. And, uh, but unfortunately, after some time, you know, when you compute, uh, when you have long computations, those GPUs are starting to heat uh, and it has about 90 uh, degrees Celsius. And so those plastic straps started to melt. So our CEO replaced those by metal ones. Uh, but uh, when we were training our nets, uh, this uh, plastic box from the milk started to melt. So we've migrated to the standard, more standardized solution, uh, which are boxes like this. Uh, currently, we've got like combination of, of uh, in-house GPUs and cloud. Uh, but yeah, this is just for the illustration. Uh, okay, so first act that, that I will speak about is semantic segmentation. And basically in, in semantic segmentation, the goal is to determine class for each of the pixels on the image. So in this case, it's a really simple case. It's just binary semantic segmentation uh, where we would like to uh, 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 only distinguish planes from the rest of the world. But it could be, it could, it could be more complicated. You might have uh, more classes like terminal, apron, and stuff like this. Uh, second uh, topic I'll speak about is object detection. Uh, this is task where you would like to basically draw a box around every every object on the on the image uh, or every object of interest. And the third task is instant segmentation. Uh, it's basically a combination of both. Uh, in most of the most of the pictures, you can see uh, like. Uh, lines around around uh, those segments but you are basically trying to uh, to uh, say which segment uh, which pixel uh, for every pixel you would like to say to which kind of category it belongs and to which instance of the object it belongs uh, yeah so starting with semantic segmentation if you would like to play with uh, semantic segmentation i recommend or you will see that in most of the papers uh, people are benchmarking on this data set, it's Pascal VOC. And uh, first, uh, what would be the naive approach that everyone can think of? Uh, I think this naive approach is basically you can do sliding window. You can do sliding window over whole image and uh, uh, the class can be determined as, as uh, for example, you will predict like 32 to 32 patch and uh, you will you will see there's nothing so you will consider it uh, consider it as background and when you will be somewhere here and you will have patch like this and classifier will say oh this this is airplane so you will consider the middle pixel being airplane and you can slide over the whole image in this way uh, but you will have uh, several problems first of all is that uh, you know, in this in this satellite imagery, it's quite good, but uh, you can have photo of, for example, I don't know if I would take photo from here, then people would have different different sizes, and some people that are in background are are, are going to be smaller on that picture than those people that are in foreground. So in this case, you will probably have to do this sliding window with different different sizes of window, and then you can do something like. Uh, you can predict from, let's say, 11, 10 classifiers and uh, use majority vote. But uh, this very naive approach would be problematic because it would take a long time, a long time, especially on the inference. So inference from this kind of classifier would take really long time. So uh, back in 2015, uh, uh, one research team from Berkeley came with this uh, idea that's called FCNs, Fully Convolutional Neural Networks uh, for Semantic Segmentation. And I think this was a breakthrough in, in the area of semantic segmentation, or at least I, I see it uh, this way. And uh, basically their idea, they were one from the first uh, who switched from patch-wise classification to something that's uh, learnable upsampling. So they basically, uh, as I shown uh, previously, the VGG network, uh, they basically did, uh, they basically took the VGG network, uh, they moved out uh, 
fully con uh, they moved out uh, classifying layer and they put their learnable upsampling layer. And nowadays there are many different l learnable upsampling, but, but back then it was so-called deconvolution in their paper, but uh, better name is transposed convolution or more widely name is transposed convolution. Uh, basically in the paper they introduced three kinds of networks, but everything was based on VGG and uh, they originally came up with uh, this straightforward uh, FCM32 network uh, that, uh, was, that, that was doing, that was just VGG with the upsampling at the end and uh, it produced, uh, produced segmentation like this. It was very gross, it, was one, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't able to, uh, to focus on details. So they they edit uh, skip connections after pooling layer four and pooling layer three, and they basically created FCN eight that was able to uh, to do more details. Uh, from my personal experience, uh, uh, disadvantage of FCN eight is that usually you need a little bit more data than for FCN thirty two to train it. Uh, yeah. Uh, there is, uh, here is a description of the deconvolution layer. It's basically a convolutional layer, but other way around. Uh, you are, you're basically just upsampling, so you are running, uh, you are, you are running this as a, uh, if you run forward, you run it as a backward pass for the convolution. Uh, in uh, nowadays, there are improvements of this, basically. Uh, in some papers, I think in 2015, people introduced atros convolutions or dilated convolutions that are shown on the picture here. So those are convolutions with uh, basically spaces between, between uh, pixels. And this is uh, possible to learn for upsampling. People are playing with subpixels. Uh, those are very famous for super resolution papers, but it works pretty well also for for semantic segmentation, and uh, yeah, if you need uh, if you need improvement of this fully convolutional network, re you can replace VGG by re by ResNet. Uh, yeah, so now second interesting paper from the same year uh, for semantic segmentation was about deconvolution networks. Uh, it was called deconvolution networks, and uh, it was uh, it was a bit newer. They were referencing that ensemble of these deconvolution networks and FCNs together works better than uh, than just uh, than just deconvolution network itself. And here is uh, here are uh, here are those uh, basically it's one VGG that's uh, that's from the image almost to the classifier and from from the classifier or from the uh, fully connected layer back to the original image. They use again, uh, they used transpose convolutions in that paper, uh, but they edit also so called unpooling layers. Uh, what I would say about our unpooling layers, it's pretty simple operation. So you basically, uh, oh, it's, it's not, it's bad visibility of the image, but yeah, uh, you, you basically take. Uh, uh, you basically take pooling in um, in most cases max pooling in those ne in in VGG and you remember the position from where you took the maximum. Here it was uh, top right, uh, top right, uh, bottom right, bottom right, and you remember those indexes. And when you do the corresponding unpooling, you basically take the value that you have in the filter and you put it on the position from where the maximum came. And this way you can you can you can uh, basically do the upsampling or unpooling. Uh, one disadvantage of this operation is you can you can find it in cafe, you can find it in uh, torch, but if you are working with TensorFlow and Keras and this kind of stack, it's still not there. Uh, actually, uh, I started issue on that like a year ago, and it's. Uh, one from the biggest uh, one from the biggest sources uh, of emails to me till now, and uh, a lot of people are liking trying different approaches, commenting. Uh, there were I counted uh, by this weekend like five tries uh, to implement this, including one mine, and 
uh, nothing was accepted, nothing was too fast, and uh, yeah, still, still there is no unpooling layer in TensorFlow. Uh, yeah, and at the end of semantic segmentation, I would say uh, what you should look at for what, what can be improvements still. Uh, it's one paper that's called Segnet, and uh, another paper, especially for histological samples in medicine, UNET works pretty well. Uh, and uh, people also use conditional random fields, uh, but I've never tried it, so I'm not expert on that. So, uh, but based on some papers, it works. Uh, second area I'll speak about today is object detection. Uh, and regarding object detection, again, you can play with the Pascal VOC dataset or even Microsoft Cocoa dataset uh, that I'll mention on, on instant segmentation slide later on. And again, here you can think of basic approach, uh, basic naive approach that would be doing again sliding window and at the position where, where you see where you see an airplane, you say uh, classifier will say airplane, and uh, yeah, this is ba this is basically it. Uh, it's uh, in fact it's a bit more complicated. Uh, there is one task that is very similar to to object detection, but b uh, when you have it's uh, when you have just one object, and when you know in advance that you will have just one object. You do localization instead of uh, instead of uh, object detection, and uh, basically there is one trick for it. Uh, that's to use uh, two heads on top of the neural net. You use one uh, head that's uh, that's doing the classification, and ones that doing the bounding box uh, bounding box regression. Uh, again, in combination with sliding window and. Yeah, at the end, it gives you some kind of object detection. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, here is I'll skip the overfeed. But I, I, from my point of view, what's interesting in this in this area is uh, uh, the idea that you have some kind of region proposal, and after that region proposal, you are trying to classify those regions to final classes. And uh, back in 2013, I guess this method is even older, and it's not a deep learning method. It's uh, basically, it's basically just standard computer vision method, and uh, it was widely used in papers that came later on. Uh, people are using for object uh, for for object proposal those uh, basic methods like selective search. And the idea behind this is just uh, that you are, you will, uh, in, in fact there is uh, selective search stands for like several methods, it's not just one. There are uh, various tricks and hacks how to do it, but the basic idea is that you, you, you try to randomly initialize a lot of rectangles around the image and always to merge those two that are more similar. Uh, uh, the way you do it here is that you convert, uh, basically you convert image from RGB to HSV and other spaces and you try to build feature vector for each of the pixels and then you try to uh, merge those two regions that are the most similar at the time. And it basically produces you regions at the end, but yeah, it's... Uh, it's the basic method, and uh, why, I w why I was mentioning it is that uh, people were using this in papers called RCNN at the beginning, uh, before before they came up with region proposal networks. Uh, RCNN was, from my point of view, uh, one from the. For one, one from the first methods that are really interesting for object proposal and one from the big breakthroughs. Uh, but it has still a lot of disadvantages. It was re uh, really uh, inefficient from the computational point of view. And the way it worked was basically it again used, uh, can use uh, backbone neural network, for example, VGG. And uh, again, uh, you do it that you take either pre-trained neural network or fine-tuned neural network and from that neural network you throw away uh, fully connected layers and uh, and the classifier at the end and uh, so you basically have feature extractor 
And the way it worked, uh, that you took whole the, uh, whole, all the proposed regions and you extracted features from, from, from the neural network. And uh, at the end, uh, you, you save those features and you, you train SVM model, uh, like binary SVM models on top of those features for each of the classes that you had at the end of the network. Uh, so if you had 20 classes, you had 20 SVMs at the end, 20 binary SVMs, and you were trying to predict uh, from those features. It was uh, really difficult uh, training and really difficult to work with this. So I think one year later they came up with fast RCNN. Uh, that's, uh, that was significant improvement, like eight, uh, they say 8.8. 8. Uh, I've seen some, pa uh, some, uh, some people claiming that it's like even 25 times faster but the main trick here was that you didn't you don't have to you don't have to use SVMs at the end uh, and you can uh, use this region of interest pooling layer that's interesting layer uh, basically you have again you are using region proposal method in this paper it was still selective search that gave you regions you are you are extracting features through the network and at one point uh, you had region of interest in, uh, interest uh, pooling layer that basically uh, reduced dimensions of this of this uh, of this region of interest uh, to the uh, uh, to the given size so the the pooling was different based on the based on the based on the size of this input or different it, it, it still had the same output size but different input size and after this region of pooling layer uh, they put uh, FC uh, fully connected layers and uh, one had for softmax classifier and one had for bounding box, box regression and uh, basically this uh, region of interest pooling layer enabled to train this network end-to-end -end. and uh, this was significant improvement in time and also in, in, uh, uh, in object uh, detection performance. Uh, after fast RCN, R, uh, RCNN came faster RCNN and what I like in here is this uh, is this region proposal network, which was basically first? Uh, not, I don't know if first time, but uh, uh, first time f f from when people started to widely use this region proposal network instead of selective search. Uh, it turned out that it, it, it turned out that it works actually better. Uh, basically, the way it worked was again you have you have shared shared convolutional layers. Uh, you do you uh, you run uh, image through that layers and at the end uh, you have feature space that you are uh, you use once for training of the region proposal network and once for uh, for classification the way they trained this was uh, they are different different they were different approach, uh, improvements but in this original paper the way people trained this was uh, First, they uh, they used uh, pre-trained uh, pre-trained uh, uh, VGG. Uh, they uh, thrown away uh, final layers. They put their uh, put their uh, region proposal network, and uh, the region proposal network has uh, had one head uh, where it was uh, which was classifying class or no class. It wasn't distinguishing among different classes. And one head that was uh, that uh, yeah that was doing the regression of the bounding box, and there was like the sliding window on the feature uh, feature map, and this was the way it was trained, and they trained it separately in the original paper. Then they took it uh, they then they took proposals from the neural network and trained it end to end with the classifier at the top. And there was third round of the training where they took again uh, just just this part with the with the region proposal network. They trained it, then they s uh, switched and plugged the classifier again, and so it was this four stage training. Uh, how the region proposal network worked? Uh, basically, there was as I said sliding window classification and regression of the bounding box it was really small neural network 
so it was pretty fast and uh, then there was kind of trick because you know objects can have different shapes so they used so k anchors uh, anchor boxes which they uh, took the uh, to the central pixel and they made like different different translation different sizes and different shapes for this uh, yeah and uh, this faster RCNN uh, its advantage was uh, or, or it was so popular that it started it, it was uh, used in later papers uh, yeah w where else to look uh, for for Object detection definitely uh, feature pyramid networks. Uh, it's pretty recent paper from Facebook. Then uh, there are YOLO. You only look once networks, and uh, it turns out that uh, instant segmentation techniques works pretty well for object uh, detection as well. Uh, yeah. Uh, now instant segmentation, which is the last. The last tasks, uh, task, and uh, from my point of view, is the most complicated one. Uh, it's kind of combination of semantic segmentation and object detection, and uh, data set for it. Uh, Microsoft Coco is, is the one that everyone uses, and it's uh, all the work on this is pretty recent. It seems to me that. Uh, those really breakthrough papers are from 2015 and and uh, and on, uh, and uh, yeah, this is from the from the Facebook research. It's uh, it's uh, DeepMask. It was I think very popular because it has pretty nice uh, reference implementation in Torch. Uh, and uh, the way it works is uh, in original paper they used to have uh, have their VGG right now they uh, in that reference implementation they replaced that by by ResNet uh, so you take the original image and you run it again through the feature extractor and then you have again two branches but uh, one branch is uh, just caring about binary mask so you have just you have just binary mask of the object, and second branch that's got a, a score, uh, which is either one or zero, true or false. Uh, true, it's, or I guess in the paper it was one and minus one, but uh, it's true in the case that majority of the object is inside of, inside of the image, and false if, uh, majority, if there is no object in the image or majority is outside of the image. And they use this, uh, this uh, they use this uh, this loss in order to train the network, and it turned out that it worked. It was the best uh, region proposal till that time, from that time. So, uh, but uh, they uh, it still wasn't uh, it still wasn't uh, perfect. So they came up with small improvement improvement that's called sharp mask, and uh, basically in this paper they uh, introduced so-called refinement modules which were modules uh, that looked like this and they basically they basically uh, did the forward pass and in the backward pass they were they were refining the mask predicted by the deep mask so the mask was more uh, was more accurate than than it uh, than it was using just the deep mask uh, and uh, you know, still, it w it was it would be just the region proposal network without any any classification, and you would have just regions. But uh, they need to they needed to somehow somehow classify the stuff. So it seems to me, in my eyes, they just used the brute force for this. Uh, it uh, it's multipath net. It's called multipath net, and uh, basically it uh, it used those proposed regions from sharp mask, and then VGG, uh, and basically there was one more trick that they zoom. They had like uh, original proposed region, then zoomed out region, and region that was even more zoomed out, and they had like four levels of zoom. I think in the paper they say the reason was that they had four GPUs, so they used for for zoom levels, um, and uh, and then uh, they put their uh, classifier on different levels of I/O from uh, it's, it's in, which, which is intersection over union. That's uh, metric for this, and it says how how much those two regions are intersecting. 
and they use this this uh, classifiers at the end and bounding box regressor and basically this this uh, was enough for the second place in the coco competition uh, there was actually better one for better better uh, network from the microsoft uh, a research and it uh, was slight improvement or, or it, it, it combined uh, met, uh, it combined uh, uh, faster RCNN it used fa uh, faster RCNN for object detection then they took just those uh, instances that were detected by faster faster RCNN and they used something comparable comparable to uh, to deep mask, but only on those few regions, and they did the segmentation on the on the second end of the layer uh, of the network, and the f they did a third branch for the entire classification. Uh, so basically, it looks like this, and the loss was computed like the loss of the bounding box, then loss of the segmentation, and loss of the classification. And basically, using this network, they won uh, the competition in 2015. And uh, till recent time, it was it was the best uh, paper so far for for uh, instance segmentation. But uh, two weeks ago, uh, Facebook research came with mask RCNN. It's pretty new paper, so I'm still not 100% sure. Uh, how it works, or I, I've, I've still haven't seen implementation for this. There are several people trying to implement this in TensorFlow, and in uh, Facebook is claiming that they will release implementation in Torch pretty soon. But what are the basic ideas? Uh, on the first side, it looks very similar uh, to this cascade, but uh, it's 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 slightly different. Basically, it used again the faster RCNN for object detection, but uh, then it has two branches: one for mask uh, masks uh, prediction and one for classification uh, below. And uh, basically, it runs all the, it it uh, it doesn't it classifies uh, those things independently, and it doesn't classify just step by step like this so uh, they have two stage training first of all they train uh, they train faster RCNN and then they have uh, then they are training separately binary mask and classification and they came up with so-called uh, region of interest align layer and this should improve a bit uh, position uh, improve a bit position of the mask because in this paper and uh, uh, sharp mask, deep mask. It appeared that uh, those uh, regions uh, weren't uh, properly aligned, so they came up with this layer that helped a lot. Uh, and one more idea: uh, when you have multi-class classification, uh, they have uh, they have classes that are not competing to each other in uh, f in terms of uh, mask uh, binary mask prediction. So basically they do it independently for every class and it turns out it works better uh, since there is still no implementation for this uh, I'm, I am I just believe uh, Facebook research that it really works the best right now but uh, I'm not 100% sure about, about it uh, and we'll see in I guess few months that uh, it really works the best Yes, so at the end, uh, I would, uh, if you would like to start with semantic segmentation, object detection, instance segmentation, I would definitely recommend to uh, start with uh, reference implementations. They are mostly at the beginning, all of them were in CAFE, uh, but uh, recently all, all, the, all the implementations from either Stanf Oh, Stanford, I'm not sure, for, but a lot of implementations from Stanford and all of the implementations from Facebook Artificial Intelligence Research Group are in Torch and uh, they are starting to pop up also implementations in TensorFlow or Keras. Uh, so if you would like to start to build your own network, I definitely, uh, definitely recommend to start with one of those reference implementations. 
Uh, I would say that those implement uh, those papers here are really good starting point, but uh, usually you need to customize your stuff because uh, because those networks are working pretty well on ImageNet or on those benchmark data sets. But using this in real world is sometimes problematic because of some liars. Uh, that might either work badly for small objects or big objects. So you need to think of your data and uh, build something custom most of the time. But sometimes this, these networks are enough. Yeah, uh, and at the end I would mention, as I said, I'm from Space Snow. We are, we are hiring uh, and if you want to play with this stuff all day long, uh, I think it's going to be a good place for you. And uh, same if you if you are interested in building infrastructure uh, infrastructures for this mostly in Python. Yeah, so maybe time for questions. Yeah. So sorry, could you just? Hi, thanks for the talk. Could you please talk a little bit about what you're using deep learning? in space now what problems you're using it on uh yeah i can say that we uh, do basically all the three problems that i i went through here uh we do also others but i can't i i can't like uh, concretely speak about this but uh, about uh, some projects but yeah we we do something we do we do we, we do use neural networks for even for classification semantic segmentation but we have yeah, we have various tasks for this. Uh, yeah, the area in space now is uh, we work with satellite imagery. Yeah, so I, I was uh, this talk wasn't like uh, supposed to be like space space uh, space now promo or advertisement, but uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I forget to mention that we work with satellite imagery and we do we do yeah we do machine learning on top of it. Uh, can I have a question? Here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, so the satellite images, I suppose they are high resolution, and your planes or whatever objects you are looking for are small. So how do you solve this problem? By sliding window or other methods? Uh, yeah, I'm afraid that I can't comment on that <laughs> that much, or I, I can't. Uh, but yeah, yeah it's, it's, uh, if you look in papers, how people work with small objects, you can find something. Uh, we have our own custom things that I can't disclose here. But yeah, uh, it's it's it's. Uh, you are right that it's a it's a problem to work with uh, with objects that are too small or way too big. So yeah. <laughs> uh, may I ask what is the performance metric uh, for for example? Yeah, for most of these tasks, it's uh, or for for. Definitely for semantic segmentation and instance segmentation, people use, uh, or for semantic segmentation, they use IO, which is intersection over union, uh, which is uh, basically how those regions are overlapping each other. And uh, yeah, I don't have any defini definition of IO here. Uh, I think I can definitely find it on. Or maybe we can take it offline, and uh, yeah, I can show you the formula. And yeah, for for others, it's it's I always widely used metric for this. Not the only one. They they are using for classification, uh, MAP, standard one. And it depends. It depends on your task. If you look at Kaggle, they use they use different ones as well. And but I always very widely used for this. Somebody else? Okay. So, so how m how many pictures do you need in order to train your network? Like, is it thousands, it's, millions? It's uh, it really differs a lot. For example, on those uh, most of those networks uh, are originally trained on ImageNet, which, which is really a huge data set. And oh, and uh, basically, uh, basically, uh, then they take just small data set that you, that is your custom one, and you just fine tune the network. That's one trick you can use for small amount of images. 
but usually usually using stochastic gradient descent it needs a lot of lot of images like uh, tens of thousands maybe uh, but uh, you can have other optimizers like Adam that can work with slightly less images but it depends it's not maybe it's not about uh, about uh, images that you have but it's about about the variab about the amount of images but about the variability amount of uh, among those images S and about your data set if you if you need just if you know this data set like the uh, numbers it's it's not that var uh, it's it's almost always the same those numbers and there isn't that big variability so you need less images than for for example if you have if you have arbitrary photo uh, then it's uh, then it's uh, getting then it's uh, then you need more images yeah. Uh, uh, I have similar questions. Uh, are you using uh, artificially rendered images for training? Because I know uh, branches or uh, where artificial images are used for this. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Is it relevant uh, to space space imagery? Uh, is it? You c we can. We are playing with that as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there are different ways of augmenting images. So yeah, definitely image augmentation is a really big thing. You can use it for. You know, you have to think about it, uh, about uh, if it makes sense for you. Uh, for some domains, uh, you can for, uh, you can use like rotations. But for example, if you have images of people standing on the ground and you turn them yeah. upside down, then it doesn't make much sense. But yeah. you mentioned that there is sort of a lot of papers which are concerned with. Uh, Segmentation. What is the current precision? You, you mentioned Microsoft, Facebook, like competing. So, what is the level of precision they achieve? Yeah, I'm not really sure about e exact numbers in every each of the categories, but it was, I think, for instance, segmentation. It was something around. Uh, it depends on different data sets, uh, but I think on this on the Microsoft Coco, it was something over 80 percent. So I think I think it's pretty good for. Us. Okay. So this question is related to the previous question. Uh, how do you measure the quality of those predictions or segmentations whatsoever? Yeah, I uh, I think I was uh, already answering for this. It's like the measure is mostly uh, interse intersection over union. Uh, there is also MAP, uh, which are standard metrics uh, metrics for for these tasks. Yep. So we, we, uh, maybe it's the second question for this, so I can try to find the formula for for. Intersection over union and uh, uh, basically, here is like uh, example uh, the way how it's measured. Uh, yeah, this isn't the best one, but yeah, this one, this one is. Uh, yeah, this is like the example illustration. For example, this is for for uh, object detection. There is measured like intersection over union between between the original original mask and the mask that was uh, that was uh, predicted. And uh, for your in, uh, for for this is like I/O 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.9, and basically what you do uh, in those region proposal networks, you you take those proposed regions that have bigger threshold than than some number, and you classify only those, and basically this is one from the metrics that that's used for it. And maybe exact formula. Uh, I think it's yeah. Yeah, it's like this. So it's pretty simple. Area of overlap over area of union. Yeah, in segmentation you can use the same thing. You basically you ba you basically don't just have rectangles, but you have you have uh, 
you have uh, something that's that's not that's just uh, some kind of blob, and two uh, you can measure again overlap of those two blobs. Okay. And if you have uh, multi multiple instances, uh, uh, do you compute it as overall area of, of uh, unions, uh, or uh, d d does it d do you consider for each one? For example, if you miss uh, one instance at all, is it worth or it isn't? It depends. I think in uh, most of the competitions they use uh, they use just overall computation. But for some tasks, you need to you need to you know customize this metric to what you what do you need. More questions? Okay. If not, let me thank you again.